Hello, everybody, and welcome to our 2020 Virtual Earth Day Rally. We are absolutely so excited that you guys are here today with us. Today is so special because it's the 50th anniversary of the first Earth Day. So 50 years ago today, there were 20 million people who took to the streets across the country. Many credit the first Earth Day to bringing us the Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, and the Environmental Protection Agency. So now, with everything going on, it's time to make this Earth Day historic too, and use this moment to create the world we need. So, what's up friends? We are your MCs for today's rally, and we're so excited to be here. I'm Samaj, and I'm an 18-year-old senior at David Douglas High School. Stay strong, seniors. Hey everyone, I'm Yenna. I'm 17 years old, and I'm a junior at Cleveland High School. And I'm Daisy, I'm 17 years old and a junior at Cleveland as well. So to start us off, we have been hard at work with many other youth, 350PDX, the Youth Environmental Justice Alliance at Opal, the Asian Pacific American Network of Oregon, Anik Bayan, Sunrise PDX, and more to bring this virtual rally to you. We have some absolutely amazing speakers lined up and I cannot wait for you to hear from them. But first, I'm gonna pass it over to my friend Samaj to ground us in the place that we're in. Thank you everyone for being here. The exciting new nature of a virtual rally is that there are people joining us from all over the region right now, not just in Portland. So welcome from wherever you may be joining us. We're so happy you're here. We're going to start by taking a moment to acknowledge that all of us leading this virtual rally are speaking to you from Stoneman land. So let us begin this rally by honoring the indigenous peoples who have lived and are still living in sacred relationship with the land on which myself and other rally speakers are likely and likely most of you in the audience are gathered. This land has been traditionally inhabited and cared for by the Multnomah, Kathalamit, Clackamas, Chinook, Tawaj, and Kalapuya, Malala, and various other tribes who have lived beside the Columbia and the Amlet Rivers for generations upon generations. We honor their legacy, their lives, and their descendants to carry upon tribal traditions for present and future generations. We recognize and uplift their resilience today, knowing that Portland has the ninth largest urban native population in the country, with more than 380 tribal affiliations living in the city. We recognize the deep scar of, colon of colonization and how it has caused the perpetuated systems that have given us the climate crisis we face today. We recognize that these peoples have much to teach us about living in the right relationship with the land, and we strive to follow their lead in our movement for a just and equitable world. We recognize that Earth Day is nothing new to indigenous communities. In fact, Earth Day has been every day since the time immemorial for centuries. We know that in order to truly stop the worst effects of climate crisis, we must actively, we must actively decolonize ourselves, our approaches to this work, and what, we and what we envision success to be. Every step of the way, we recognize this is an ongoing journey and we fully commit ourselves to it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for that, Samaj. We also wanna take a moment to acknowledge the scary time that we're all in right now and let you know that we value any emotions you're having about these crises and that you're not alone. So to all of the people who are impacted by this pandemic that can't be here today with us, like healthcare workers, grocery workers, and other essential workers, people who are sick because of the virus, people who are taking care of their young children who aren't in school, we just wanted to say that we see you and we are with you. So to all of you who were able to join us here as well, thank you so much for being here. Now, I have the honor of getting to introduce our very first speaker, Mia Sedery. She is a junior at Wilson High School and was a Verslandia top 10 finalist in 2018. And she uses poetry to speak out about social and climate justice. Take it away, Mia. Dear people of this world, we have 10 years before catastrophic irreversible climate change arises. So I'd strongly advise that we realize and open our eyes before it all amplifies and we stop jeopardizing our futures. The earth is warming and giving us warnings and we need to listen. Wildfires, melting ice caps, droughts and hurricanes, oil spills, food shortages and increased rains. Can you not hear the earth screaming at us? Dear people of this world, I want to remind you of the people who need your help. I want to remind you why you need to care. I want to remind you that communities of color breathe in 40% more polluted air than white communities, and POC and the US are 38% more likely to bear exposure to asthma-causing pollutant shares from industrial sources and coal plants. 
I want to remind you that the Pacific Islanders and native coastal communities are living in danger where extreme storms, flooding and rising seas are anything but rare. The Pacific Islands are predicted to be submerged by the end of the century. And that's near. And Pacific Islanders have to live with this fear. Climate change is killing 250,000 people every year and we need to care. Dear people of this world, I want to remind you of the earth you're saving, of nature's perfect beauty that smiles down sunshine and paving its way to create life. Do me a favor today and notice the quiet elegance covering our world like a coat of freshly fallen snow, the way it smells the moment after the first spring rain like a dream. Notice the way the light serenades the morning with its dreams, the way the sunset sounds like the melody of ocean waves and flying wings, the gift of nature's abundant progression of experience. Dear people of this world, and that includes you, you listening right now, we've always been told to reach for the stars, but this time the stars are reaching to us and asking us to use our light to heal the hurt we've caused as humans. I don't wanna guilt you or overwhelm you because this responsibility is larger than any other, but I want to remind you that we are in this together. When you feel like you're fighting for justice alone, know that we're all here with you and we all care too. And together we can make change to do things that will save our planet and know this too. We might not all have platforms or power, but we all have a voice and we all have the choice to speak out. So let's use it. Let's advocate and educate and communicate Let's march through gates, rewrite our fates, and initiate change. Let's fight for this as if our future depends on it, because it does. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much, Mia. That was awesome. Hey, everyone who's watching, show your love to me in the comments. So now I get to move us to the next part of the rally, and I get to introduce two amazing people from the Oregon Just Transition Alliance, we're here to talk about the Oregon Green New Deal. So that's right, we have a vision for a bold Green New Deal platform by and for Oregon being written right now, and we get to hear firsthand from those who helped create it. Um, Jose Mikulaskis um, works at Verde as the climate justice organizer, where he works with the statewide Oregon Just Transition Alliance. Jose belongs to many identities, as many of us do, and has navigated the world sifting through being indigenous, Mexicano, a proud immigrant, and Chicano. Jose has, been Jose has been devoted to his communities and justices for as long as he could remember, including the environmental hazards many communities, communities are inflicted with, and now is a steadfast advocate and organizer for his community. Han Pham works for the Oregon Opal Environmental Justice Oregon as the Alliance's director, where she leads the statewide Oregon Just Transition Alliance. She is Vietnamese American and is a working mom with, five -year, with a five-year-old daughter who starts kindergarten at PPS this year. Khan was a founding leader of and spokesperson for the groundbreaking Portland Clean Energy Fund Initiative, which raises $50 million a year for renewable energy and other green jobs and job training and prioritizing low-income communities and communities of color. Wow. Take it away, Khan and Jose. Hi everyone, um, my name is Khan Pham and I work as mentioned with Opal and both Opal and Verde are, are part of um, a statewide alliance called the Oregon Just Transition Alliance, uh, which is a statewide alliance of community groups representing frontline communities across the state um, who are fighting for a just transition in Oregon. Um, we have been fighting because for just transition because we know that even before this crisis, we were already facing the worst economic inequality since the Great Depression, um, a climate crisis that's devastating our ability to imagine a future for ourselves and our children, and a crisis of white supremacy, where um, you know we're facing rising xenophobia and attacks on Black, Indigenous, and people of color communities. Jose. Um, uh, um, 
So I think there's a little technical difficulties. Um, so I'm gonna just share a little bit more about our vision of um, an Oregon Green New Deal. Jose is going to, um, Jose is gonna be joining us in a, in a few minutes. Um, <laughs> so, you know, as you know, we're facing the worst public health and economic crisis of our lifetimes. This novel coronavirus is exposing just how unjust the economy is and how it doesn't work for most of our people. So, you know, systemic inequality already existed before this public health crisis, um, but now it's just been made worse by the pandemic that we're all currently living with. And unless we take action, um, this systemic inequality will continue after. Welcome, Jose. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, apologies. Um, don't know why my camera isn't starting when it was before. But yeah, as Khan was saying, right now, Black and Brown communities are being hit hardest right now because of lack of access to healthcare and institutionalized racism that's present in our healthcare system. Not to mention other forms of healthcare not being sufficiently recognized, like housing, you know, because housing is healthcare. Um, and just, just like how immigrants and refugees, regardless of their status, are essential workers. This matters because essential workers don't get to work from home, aren't always given paid leave, and despite their essential work, many of them won't get stimulus checks because of their status. Now, what does a just recovery look like? Well, we don't wanna go back to the way things were before because that economy is not working for most of our working families. And just how we, just how we use this recovery to lay the foundation of a just transition is critical because we need a people's bailout and we need to make sure that black and brown communities are centered in this recovery process. Now, what does that mean? What does that look like? This means creating a systems where community members have real decision-making power. This also means we need to make sure that black and brown communities are invested. We need to make sure that all and any money goes to communities, the communities that have been ignored for decades. I've lived in these black and brown communities for most of my life, and I've seen firsthand what negligence and community investment looks like. We need to care for the communities that have not been historically cared for and you know that are being hit hardest right now. Care means that everyone has health care, everyone has housing, and everyone has access to jobs and renewable energy. In this time, we need to be not just reactive, but also advancing proactive solutions like an Oregon Green New Deal, which is what Opal, groups like Opal and Verde and the Oregon Just Transition Alliance have been working on for the last year because the choices we make now are gonna help us build a better future out of this crisis. So over the last year, Opal Verde and the Oregon Just and frontline groups from across the state have been working together to envision what an Oregon Green New Deal could look like. Um, we were planning, we've been planning a statewide listening tour where we'll be asking and talking to frontline communities, people of color, rural people, community, uh, uh, low-income Oregonians that live all over the state. We're gonna go to Klamath County, to Coos Bay, to, to Medford and Woodburn, Eugene, the Dalles, to really talk to people about what kind of Oregon do we really need to build now? Um, and this is re more relevant than ever now that um, if, with this economic crisis, um, we need to put forth a vision about what our communities really need. So we wanna use this opportunity and invite all of you here in this virtual rally with us to, to participate in the statewide listening tour by giving us your vision of what an Oregon could look like after this. Because we know that we want to rebuild an Oregon and we're not gonna go back to the way things were. We need to go back to, we need to build a system that is more just. Um, yes, this, uh, this has been devastating. This economic crisis has been devastating. It is, as Jose said, this the worst public health and economic crisis that any of us have ever experienced in our lifetimes. But um, as our economy and as so many systems and assumptions are coming crashing down, this is also a painful opportunity for us to build something different. And so even amidst this devastation, um, I have noticed some positive things coming out of it. Um, I've seen so many people stepping up to help in mutual aid networks and um, people, neighbors are helping each other out now that didn't talk to each other. And we're recognizing that we depend so much on workers, whether they're food service workers or healthcare workers. And we're, we're 
we're realizing how interconnected we are and how how much we depend on one another and that we need to take care of the most vulnerable amongst us. Um, I guess one of the things I'm most excited about are some of the ideas that used to be considered fringe even just three or four months ago, right? Um, like a universal basic income or um, were considered extreme like Medicare for all um, are now considered possible and, and even acceptable. Um, so as we think about this crisis and how we want to move forward, we need to take the long view uh, about what, what do we want to tell our grandkids in 50 years about how we were able to reimagine our society in this time of crisis. This is one of the key questions that we're going to be asking on the Oregon Green New Deal listening tour. And I want to ask you all to join us in thinking about this question. So I'm going to, uh, I'm going to to ask you all to close your eyes, just take a moment, this is gonna take a minute, um, and imagine that it's 50 years in the future. And imagine that your grandkids are asking you about the 2020 global pandemic. What would you like to tell your grandkids and future generations about how we working together were able to transform our society during this time of transition? Just take a minute and I want you to imagine what you wanna tell your grandkids in 50 years. So we wanna hear from you about your visions, about what you wanna see um, coming out of this crisis and that what an Oregon Green New Deal can help build. So please open up a tab and I want you to write down and share some of these visions that you're thinking about. Um, you can go to this website, bit.ly bit backslash Oregon Green New Deal and fill out the survey. It's just two questions. And tell us what your vision of the Oregon that we need to build is in the aftermath of this crisis. Um, you know, we're gonna be on this virtual rally for, uh, for another hour and a half. So please, you have some time to think about it as you watch this virtual rally. So please share your vision. And at the end of the rally, we'll share back with everyone a couple of the visions of the organ we need to build out of this crisis in order to be more sustainable, more caring and more just. That was amazing. Thank you, Colin and Jose. You know, a crucial part of the Oregon Green New Deal transportation, the Oregon Green New Deal is transportation justice. I am a campaign lead for YASIA or the Youth Environmental Justice Alliance. We have been fighting for Youth Pass, which would provide a year round free public transit for everyone 18 and, 18 and under in the metro region for years. Now we're going to get to hear from some of my own role models and friends who shaped and continue to lead the Youth Pass campaign. We're now having a Youth Pass panel to hear directly from these amazing organizers where they'll be answering questions and showing how you can get involved. I'm gonna pass it over to the moderator, Adam Daniels. All right, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Adam Daniel, my pronouns are she and her. I'm 17 years old. I go to David Douglas High School and I'm with Yeja. Um, welcome to our Youth Pass panel, um, which is going to be featuring some amazing people who have been working on this campaign. Um, a quick little hist history and rundown Youth Pass is a program that gives youth in high school um, access to free bus passes, and it has been a long and hard fought battle to get to where we are now. Um, but this year we actually have an opportunity to get funding for a regional youth pass for all youth 18 and under, under um, regardless of any of their circumstances um, through Metro's 2020 um, Get Moving Bond. And so um, I wanna introduce some of our panelists um, who are in all different positions of advocating and being youth pass advocates and um, wanting to educate you all on and more. 
So um, I would love for our panelists to come on and introduce your name, pronouns, age, um, school and organization, if any of those apply. Okay, um, Nia, could you start? Uh, hi, everybody. Oh, maybe um, anybody. <laughs> oh, oh, I'm already going. Hi, everybody. Okay, go um, happy Earth Day. Um, glad to be here talking with y'all. Um, my name, my name is Nia. I'm a uh, Yeja intern, and I'm also a. Uh, <laughs> I'm a senior in high school. Uh, my pronouns are she, they, and yeah. Glad to be here. All right. Thank you, Nia. And anybody can just pop in and go next at whatever order. Hi, um, my name is Vivian. My pronouns are they, them. I'm 17 and I go to David Douglas High School. I am a campaign lead with Asia. Hi, everyone. My name is Gabby Fan. I'm 18 years old. I use she, her pronouns. I graduated from Reynolds High School. And I'm on the Multnomah Youth Commission's uh, Transit, Equity, and Environmental Advocacy Committee. Hi, my name is Kendi Schwing. I use she and her pronouns. I'm also a member of the Multnomah Youth Commission, and I also sit on the Transit, Equity, and Environmental Advocacy Committee. Hi everyone, my name is Nicole Johnson. I um, am the community engagement manager at 1000 Friends of Oregon. Um, my pronouns are she, her. And um, back in 2012, 2013, um, I was the youth organizer at Opal Environmental Justice Oregon where I worked on the Youth Fast campaign. Thank you for having me. Thank you all for being a part of this. We appreciate your time and effort towards Youth Pass. Um, so let's just get into this. Um, this is, you know, quite unconventional, but I'm glad that we're all here today together working on this. So, um, Nia and Nicole, could y'all speak on what does environmental justice mean to you and how does that intertwine with transportation justice? Um, should I start out? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so environmental justice to me, I, I think when you think of environmental justice, um, it's important to think of it in the context of environmental racism. And I just want to kind of point out um, what that is, um, intentional, intentional design or per, the perpetuation of institutional racism. Um, and actions and decisions that result in disproportionate exposure to people of color, um, environmental hazards or health burdens. And um, when I think about um, the decisions and the actions that are made intentionally, um, to me, environmental justice is the movement to um, break those things and to include people of color into the, the decision-making process and to make sure that um, the burdens and benefits are distributed in a way where um, it's not concentrated in communities of um, black and brown folks. Thank you so much. Nia, do you want to add to that or speak on that? Well, for sure, I agree with all the points Nicole said. Um, I think of it the same way. Like it's That's what it is. It's, it really is incorporating the people who are most impacted by these environmental issues into the process of like decision making. And um, I think that, you know, that is a way to aid all of the environmental racism that are put on those people, you know, because a lot of these things are happening in places where they live, pray, educate, you know, it's like, so yeah. Um, I also think uh, that that does greatly overlap and intertwine with transportation justice because, um, a lot of environmental racism happens in these in these transportation areas, and that's a big part of like youth pass and why we advocate because a lot of the people who have been advocating for all these years are impacted by these issues. And um, yeah, I, I agree. 
Cool. Thank you guys so much for that explanation on environmental justice. And um, I think it's really enlightening and helpful to youth pass advocacy. And I was wondering, um, how is youth pass an environmental justice issue? Um, Vivian, would you like to start on that one? Yeah, totally. So I agree with Nicole and Nia's definition of environmental justice. Um, I really do think that includes the fair treatment and protection of all people equally and making sure that everyone has access to clean air, water, food, land, and transportation, and ensures that everyone can live in like a safe and healthy environment. And I think the way that Youth Pass is connected to, to um, environmental justice is that because it is a form of access to transportation and that is a right that everyone should have it is not a privilege and also by advocating and trying and implementing a youth pass program that's inclusive and equitable it will help fight against environmental racism that's super awesome thank you so much and um, Nia, do you have anything you'd want to add to that on how you think you pa Youth Pass is critical to um, environmental justice? Um, definitely. I fully agree with everything Vivian said. I think it's, um, I think Youth Pass is extremely important. Um, not only because, I mean, I, I myself need it, but I know how many other youth need it. Um, and Youth Pass right now is something that uh, Portland Public School kids get and have been getting for quite some time due to amazing work that my people like Nicole. So thank you so much. But um, uh, I think this is something that all Portland youth should have, regardless of if you're a student or you know whatever the situation may be. Um, the fact that this is only something that right now is being given sort of as like a benefit to um, PPS students is, I mean, <laughs> it's a bit inequitable. Um, uh, this is something, this neglects these Portland student, students as well as a lot of youth in general who need this, not only right now in the midst of um, a pandemic where some youth might actually be getting some income for their families and have our essential workers who need to be out there and, you know, public transit might be something they need, but also just with, you know, regardless of pandemic, like, you know, before, after, people youth need this and yeah so for sure thank you so much for your answer um i was wondering um this is open to anyone who is interested but um what drew you to organize for youth pass in the first place i would love to hear um as many people as this resonates with like what is really that like drive? Like what brings you here all the time to just keep going at it or at the time that you've been working on this, what pushes you to get like to this point and keep pushing for it? And anybody can, um, this one's up for grabs, anyone can go for it. Um, okay. I, can, I can start. Um, okay, cool. Thank you. <laughs> I definitely want the, you know, the, the folks on the ground doing the work. Um, um, want to prioritize you all and, and uh, not speak too much. Um, but just from my experience, um, first starting out working towards expanding the youth pass um, to East Portland um, students and also just even students that weren't going to, to school or students that were in alternative schools, um, not connected to a specific district. Um, I just, I, I, I feel like um, expanding the youth pass, it's just something simple. Um, it's something that benefits everyone. Um, it benefits the, the transit system in the city to have young people that um, understand the, the transit system, use it and grow up um, as adults to use it and drive less so that, you know, that helps our city, helps, helps our transit system, helps our climate. Um, and then it helps the economy because you're giving, um, well, you're making sure that everyone has access to be able to get around, um, get to jobs, get to interviews, get to internships, um, get to school. 
Um, so I, I think that it's just so beneficial. And I think that, I guess the cost burn anal analysis just, I think it shows that we need to expand youth class and it's just the right thing to do. And so I'm continuing to fight for that. That's what kind of motivates me and fuels me. And also to see all you young, wonderful faces just fighting for your right because it's your right. Thank you so much. Um, Kendi or Vivian, would you guys like to add on to this on what is something that really draws you to organize? Like what is something that motivates you to keep going for this cause? I can talk a little bit about this. Um, I agree, of course, with like everything Nicole said. Um, just seeing how much work has been done thus far with Youth Pass, especially looking back with um, getting it into the Portland Public Schools. This has been a movement that's been focused a lot, especially um, with people of color and women with Sisters in Action. They kind of started this movement way back when. And we've seen just how much work youth have put into this and to kind of continue that fight to see this through. Um, this is a great way to get young people knowledgeable about the transportation that's around them rather than, you know, going to the common, like trying to save up for a car. Um, it's much better to get people educated on how to use the bus, how to use the max, and then we can continue to invest in this in the future. Um, and also for communities that can't afford cars, obviously it's, it makes so much sense. <laughs> like growing up in Reynolds and East County school that is very like lower income, I can see like the need for this every day going to school. And the fact that it hasn't been funded, but schools like in Portland public schools that may have even less or a more affluent population, it, it just makes sense to expand it to these other schools that might um, need it more and just everyone can benefit from this. The whole community can benefit from this. The environment can benefit from this. So it just seems like common sense to me. Cool, thank you. If anybody else wants to add, that'd be awesome. Um, for me personally, I actually didn't find out about Youth Pass until earlier this year. Um, and it was super surprising to me how long it's been, this journey of advocating for Youth Pass, yet there still isn't a program that's region-wide for all youth, 18 and under, and not means tested all year round. I mean, it seems simple to think about it, but I definitely wanted to take part in advocating for this cause just because I am definitely a part of the, I guess, the group that is impacted by not having youth pass, I guess, um, as like a young person of color who comes from a low income background. Personally, my I am heavily transit dependent. I do not rely on my parent at all for no right it's just because she's constantly working and so I want to be able to create a more inclusive and like a sustainable youth pass program for other youth in the future who don't have to go through these experiences of feeling like they don't have access to their city they don't have a right to transportation because they can't afford the fare That's super awesome. I really appreciate that. Um, I'd like to move on to the next uh, question, which is what are or were the priorities for the Youth Pass campaign now versus then? And it would be really cool to hear from like the different people working on this. So Gabby, do you have anything you want to say on like um, what you think the priorities for Youth Pass are right now? Um, so I've been working on the Youth Pass campaign for about two years. And when I joined during my first year, um, our main priorities were just finding like any source of funding for the Pass program, which was our biggest obstacle. Um, however, um, as Ada mentioned earlier, now that there is a sufficient funding opportunity on Metro's 2020 transportation bond, um, we've shifted our priorities towards advocating for the Youth Pass program to be funded enough for all youth 18 and under, which should also be year round and non-income based. Um, another thing that we're currently working on is that we are moving elected officials and the city of Portland as well to be partners with us in our work. Awesome. Thank you so much. And I was wondering, Nicole, from your background in working with um, and working in youth past like a lot longer than us, um, how does that like differ from the priorities in when you were trying to get youth past campaign across in the past? 
So in the past, and I'll have to brush up to make sure this is, um, this might not still be the case, but um, in the past, um, after the funding from the business tax um, ran out, um, there was a partnership created between the city, the county, and TriMet in order to kind of create um, a funding to continue the youth pass, and that was for Portland Public Schools. Um, and our priority at that time was you know, let's let's bring in other entities or other agencies that can kind of add to that pot and then get that expanded to East Portland schools, David Douglas, Park Rose, Reynolds, all those schools. Um, and the the yeah, so that was uh, I can talk a little bit more about the obstacles later, but um, that was kind of the priority at that time. Cool. That's really it's really cool to see how Youth Pass has grown and like how I, at that time it was like different pots of funding like from the city and now that things have changed and different places have like backed in and backed out. Um, it's really cool to see that with this like with regional Youth Pass we could probably we could probably get a lot more people covered under this and um, we can just see how all this work has grown over time, which is really amazing. Um, for the folks that don't know about the 2020 Get Moving Bond, um, what is it? Who can explain, like, what is it? Um, Kendi, if you could start on, like, explaining a little rundown of what this bond is, that'd be really awesome. Yeah, sure. Um, well, previously known as the T2020 um, bond, it's now known as the Get Moving um, Transportation Investment Measure. Basically, it's a 20-year um, seven billion dollar transportation package so it's a lot of money <laughs> so it's a big opportunity for youth pass um, that this will be um, sent to be voted on in november for multnomah clackamas and washington counties um, which is why it's been a big um, push for us to like reach out to different communities that aren't just like multnomah county based um, this package has been shaped by a task force of individuals handpicked by metro um, to basically reach out to the community and see what we think is best and most important. And Youth Pass would specifically be going out of the funding that's for, um, I think it's called the region wide program section of the funding. And it's around 50 million a year. And so we would be looking to get funding out of that. Um, so a lot of arguments that kind of claim like Youth Pass would take away from expanding um, service don't really apply because it's from a different pot of money. So just youth passes taking from this, these different services or programs and not expansion. <laughs> um, so with COVID-19, it's kind of been a little sidetracked in terms of advocating for T2020 or the Get Moving Bond, but there's definitely been a lot of work, especially things like rallies like this have been very important to get our message out. And overall the Get Moving um, bond is a unique opportunity for us to have enough funding to finally secure youth pass to be fully funded all year round for all youth 18 and under in the tri-county area awesome thank you so much for that so yeah the transportation bond a uh, whole lot of whole lot of dough you know so a lot of and then we're also competing for the smaller programs um uh funding right so um, thank you so much for that explanation. Um, another question I have is who benefits from Youth Pass if it passes? Uh, Vivian, would you like to start on that? Yeah, totally. Um, I know that Nicole touched on this earlier actually and gave a beautiful answer to this question, but obviously youth region-wide, um, they would benefit just because they would have access to transportation for free, you know, out of pocket costs for them. But Definitely our economy benefits just because people are connected to our city, to our businesses, and are able to get around. Um, just also in general, like tr public transit riders, because by, get, by increasing access to tr public transit for youth, that creates ridership in the future, which will then lead to more people using public transit, which is good for the climate anyways. Um, and also, I think it's just good for all of our communities, just because it's part of building a sustainable future. Yeah, that's that's amazing. Um, Kendi, was there anything you wanted to add to this? Yeah, everything Vivian said was perfect. It's pretty much everyone benefits from it. There's no downside to more people riding transit. Um, it can only improve the economy. It can only move us away from using cars. Um, 
it's pretty much a no-brainer. It's a great thing. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. Um, I'd like to know um, if Gabby, Nia, or Nicole could chime in on this. Um, what are the biggest obstacles you perceive now um, versus then? And like in terms of organizing youth, um, organizing TriMet, government agencies, like what are the biggest obstacles that you have faced or you think you're about to face or you're dealing with right now? Um, uh, big and small, the people you have to work with. Um, Gabby, would you like to start on that, on like the biggest obstacles you can see? Yeah, I can start. Um, so while sitting on TriMet's Transit Equity and Advisory Committee, as one out of only two youth representatives for the past two years, I have continuously experienced resistance from TriMet when asking them to support our vision of the Youth Pass program. Um, it has been extremely difficult to push TriMet to be on our side. It's taken years, but working with other agencies or community organizations such as Metro, PIPA, um, the Getting There Together Coalition, for example, um, has really helped push TriMet towards the goal that youth from the Multnomah Youth Commission and the Youth Environmental Justice Alliance have been advocating for. And our vision, um, we're very clear about it, that we want it for all youth, 18 and under, um, year round and non-income based. So that is the message that we are trying to send to TriMet. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, Nia, uh, do you wanna speak on uh, the biggest obstacles that you've faced? Uh, definitely for me personally, I feel like a lot of what I've been seeing is, um, I feel like a lot of representatives for um, like some, I'm thinking more TriMet now, but just throughout the two years of me doing this work, a lot of representatives have come up where they take it upon themselves to, I guess, discredit um, the work. And I think that um, throughout the process has been I, I don't know, it's it's the one thing that really strikes me the most um, or even the numbers that we bring up because I know like before Kendi was bringing up the um, the part that we're actually asking for the funding from and the 50 million, we're not even asking for that. Like, you know, it's, so it's, it's really boggling to see how some people will come up with facts or, you know, call, comebacks and strike backs that are like completely just <laughs> they're outlandish um, and they really do nothing to um, improve or even hinder our progress. It kind of just keeps us in this weird limbo of like, we don't know where we stand with them. And um, so, yeah, I think that's the, the thing to me that's been the biggest like obstacle. Great, thank you so much for that. And um, Nicole, would you like to speak on some obstacles that you've faced in the uh, organizing around youth pass and um, what government agencies or different organizers you've worked with and um, if any of those have been uh, hard to get through? Yeah, I can, I can talk about a few things. The first thing um, that I had to go through um, was orienting myself with um, how to work um, in collaboration with youth, with young people. Um, I feel like in our um, agencies and as, you know, adults, um, we can, we can um, hinder youth voice or, or pr pretend like we're listening. Um, and I think that I first had to center myself and what it looks like to work in collaboration with youth and then um, help facilitate conversations between um, the, the decision makers, I guess, and young people to make sure that um, there was there was clear understanding and and um, listening, um, and so that's one. Um, and then I think some other obstacles um, just have been trying to nail down the actual cost of what Youth Pass um, is, so that we can kind of figure out what that number is, and and then um, find a solution. Uh, I think. Um, TriMet hasn't always been um, forthcoming with that number. Um, and then I think I've heard people resistant to having a youth pass that is for all students um, or all youth because of um, lack of service in some areas. Um, and the main argument is, well, 
um, schools in East Portland don't have good enough bus service, but we know that um, youth are not only using the youth pass for school, it's for all things in life. Um, and, you know, if we do expand the youth pass, that would hopefully help TriMet to see that there's a need to, you know, increase service. And then that, you know, from the ridership increasing that helps the fare box, then, you know, there's come there's money coming in, hopefully. So um, I think those have been a few of the, the obstacles that um, I've kind of dealt with with my work um, organizing for Youth Pass. Definitely. I definitely resonate with a lot of the things you got all you all said about just kind of like working with these agencies, trying to like navigate um, how much money it is, trying to get the numbers, trying to get the facts and organizing that all together with a minimal time. And um, one thing that Youth Pass helps with all this is that people, youth can't get to these places to organize with us if they don't have the transportation. So I find that like extremely important. So I'd really love to see Youth Pass so that we can actually all show up to these things and have the access to them. Um, I was really curious. Um, what is it like or what was it like to be a youth activist? And what does your activism include? Like what elements of this? And I'd love to hear um, everyone go around and say this, like say their piece on, what's it like to be a youth activist? What does it take? Like, what have you put into it? Like, um, and how is it, why is it important, you know? Um, Vivian, would you like to start? Yeah, totally. Um being a youth activist is definitely very rewarding because you know that you're contributing to a cause that will make better change in your community it'll benefit the people that you love and know that you live with your neighbors your friends your family all of these people but it can be very emotionally and mentally laborious just because it is a lot of work constantly having to fight for the your right to transportation and so sometimes it's definitely like sometimes I definitely do need like a moment to like sit back and decompress. But I know that in the end, it's all worth it just because I know that if we don't advocate for our rights then there won't be anyone else who will. That's really amazing. Thank you for speaking on that. Um, Gabby, is there something you want to say about what's it like to organize and be doing this activism? Um, I definitely agree with everything that Vivian said. Like, I just think it's really important that we step up and be in those spaces where other youth um, who aren't as privileged can't be in these spaces to speak up for themselves and what they need in their communities. And that's what we should um, be advocating for is um, like transportation is a human right and everyone deserves that regardless of where they live, what school they go to. Um, their income and it's really important that we be in these spaces because if we don't ask we, we don't advocate for um, this right for ourselves and our communities then um, it'll just be seen as a topic that um, doesn't matter when clearly it does so although it can be um, really tiring or intimidating in spaces where it's primarily um, adults or um, men or such like that um, it's really important that we have to remind ourselves like why we're there in the first place. Yeah, I definitely resonate with that. Um, Nia, would you like to speak on this and like the time and effort and everything that you've put into being a youth activist? Um, well, I definitely agree with what's been said um, before me. Um, just to touch a little bit more on like the the work it really takes to be like a youth advocate and activist. Um, I think especially like the, the age range we are right now, like not to be stereotypical, but it is a lot already. So then also to say be like, like, like me, I'm black, I'm female presenting. Those are two things that already get me a lot of, you know, stuff in the, in the world. And then to also like, be a youth activist on top of it it's a lot of stuff that makes people who i need to speak to to do this work not want to listen to me right so um i think that is one of the biggest like hindrances i guess or like things barriers for me specifically personally um but it is extremely rewarding work i think nobody is able to 
um, describe and to voice the the problems and issues that impact youth other than youth. Um, so it it is very rewarding work and it's, I think what we say and what we do is extremely powerful. So I wouldn't want it any other way, um, but it definitely, there definitely is a lot of, um, a lot of like weight to it, I would say. It's not, it's not, it's not just fun, you know? <laughs> so um, I think the panelists we have right now, um, I thank you guys for your work because it is super heavy and yeah. Yeah, I definitely, I really feel you on that, you know, I, that speaking to like, there's a lot of weight to this work, like with the downsides and like the microaggressions and those barriers, but that overcoming it is that other weight, like where it makes the greatest, the craziest impact if you, if you're successful. And I think that's really amazing. Um, Kendi, would you like to speak on your experience as a youth activist? And then um, Nicole, speak on yours. Hi, again. <laughs> um, I agree, obviously, with everything that's been said. It's extremely rewarding, but super, super taxing, like on your psyche and just everything. <laughs> um, there's a lot of being told um, that you're not doing enough or being called kid or being basically dismissed in a lot of spaces where it's mostly, you know, older people. And that can take a toll for a little bit on your self-confidence. And you have to remember like what you're doing this for, which is everyone that you're surrounded by in your age group who don't have access to these same opportunities to be doing this. Um, like it's definitely like what I'm doing there. It's like, it's not about me. It's about the other people that can't be at these workshops, that can't be at these meetings, that can't be doing this um, to fight for their own rights because they have to be at work. They have to be at home. They have to be doing whatever they can. And so it's just realizing like there are people that need people to be advocating for these things. Like Youth Pass will help so many people. And if you know we're not in here or other youth aren't in there advocating for it, like no one will be. Like we have to fight for our own um, or advocate for our own interest, <laughs> basically. Definitely. I feel you on that, um, that being dismissed and like being heard, but you know, just like. I appreciate all you guys' resilience and like keep pushing through like all that. Are these people really listening to me? Will I get what I need out of this? Um, Nicole, I would love to hear more on your personal experiences with um, youth activism. Yeah, thank you. Um, my personal experiences just consisted of um, a lot of reading and a lot of um, kind of listening and learning from organizers before me that um, had like Sisters in Action um, that had um, kind of built the path, I guess, um, and just needed, you know, more youth activists to, to come along and, and do the work and um, learn and grow and, and just speak truth to power. Um, but I will say there were times where um, it kind of felt lonely, like feeling like, you know, I was the only young person that really cared about, you know, civil, um, like being civically engaged and, and caring about issues that not only impacted me, but impacted everyone around me. Um, and I'm, I'm grateful that, you know, um, there was OPAL and there was Multnomah Youth Commissioners and um, there were other um, youth centered organizations that um, even schools that um, gave, gave me a platform to be able to talk to other youth, black student unions, um, to say, hey, you know, this issue is important to me. What do you think? Do you want to get on board? Um, and that's, um, that, that helped kind of fuel my, my activism and to, to say that, you know, maybe in high school, I was the only person that cared about being civically engaged, but in this world, um, there's, there's a lot more youth that care. So, um, that was, that was, uh, what it was like, but it was, it was hard. Um, but like Vivian said, and everyone else said, definitely worth it. And I'm um, happy to see that hopefully <laughs> um, in November, we'll all be voting um, for this for this package and to, you know, get a regional youth pass. That's amazing. Thank you guys so much. Um, that was really beautiful hearing everybody's experience with like youth, youth activism, the barriers and what it's been taking to get this, get this to where it's at now and get a youth pass on the platform it is on right now. And so lastly, I would love to hear from Vivian and Gabby on how can others get involved? What can they do right now 
to support Youth Pass? What are ways that they can get in on it and uh, make this possible for us? Because the youth need it. The youth really need it. So Vivian, Gabby, go ahead. Um, so how other youth can get involved um, in the community is um, they can join an organization um, to share their own personal stories about why Youth Pass is important, not only for the youth who rely on it, but for the community, for the planet, um, for the environment. Um, can we, um, a little plug, but um, the Multiple Youth Commission has extended their application to Friday, and you can find that at ourcommission.org or on social media. It's my commission, so you guys can apply and join in on the work that we're doing to fight for this Youth Pass program. Um, other than that, you can also share and post this campaign on various social media sites to show agencies um, that resist um, our ask, like TriMet, that the community wants and really does need this program. I agree with everything Gabby said, but boy, is there so much you can do to support Youth Pass, to uplift Youth Pass, even if you're home because of coronavirus. Um, so, in reference to the bond that Kendi was talking about earlier, Metro councilors will actually be voting in late July whether or not to defer the bond to the ballot. So during this month in, in July, you can let your Metro councilors know that you support Youth Pass and that you want a Youth Pass program that is region wide for all youth 18 and under year round and not income based. Um, 350PX on their website has an event that they're doing where they are asking people to send in 30 second testimon testimonial videos for why they want Youth Pass. And then they're going to be sending that to Metro counselors. Um, in addition to what Gabby said, you can join Organization for Youth. Um, Yeja is also recruiting. That will be something we'll be doing later this year. Um, also, in general, part following our like organization like organization Instagram pages and keeping up to date about what campaigns we're working on and what actions we're taking. Previously, Yeja held a Youth Pass online campaign to show the overwhelming support of Youth Pass. Um, and also just in general sharing this, like letting people know that this is something that's going on in our community, educating others can in like yeah, <laughs> that's about it. That was really amazing. Um, I'd like to thank all of y'all personally and everybody watching. Obviously, we'd like to thank y'all for sharing your knowledge, your experience, your time, your effort, your resilience and advocating for Youth Pass, uh, putting us on game with the information. Um, I really appreciate it. Um, all, all those things that Vivian and Gabby were saying was talking to your representatives, um, Yeja's Instagram, MYC's Instagram, keeping up with those because you can be reposting um, all the information. You can be sharing them on your stories with your friends, tagging your Metro counselors, uh, tagging TriMet, tagging all these important people. Um, social media is like one of our strongest tools right now to stay connected. So definitely tap into that. Um, those are all like various ways you can get involved in put Youth Pass on this platform and tell your parents, tell people who can vote, tell your family members, tell your friends, all that. Um, keep Youth Pass circulating. Um, and yeah, so thank you all for joining our Youth Pass panel. Y'all are all very amazing. And um, Regional Youth Pass for all. Um, we are coming to our time. And so I'm going to pass it off to our host and I believe Daisy is taking over next. But thank you all for all your hard work and effort and dedication. Um, I appreciate y'all. So let's get it. Let's get youth pass. Let's get youth pass running. What an amazing panel of people. Thank you all for your hard work on getting us the youth pass. Next up, we have a short five minute intermission while an art and photography slideshow plays so please take a bathroom break or stretch break if you need to. But make sure to come back to hear Commissioner Joanne Hardesty speak after the break.
Cast away oppression. Open the streets and watch our beliefs. And when they call my name inside the concrete, I pray it forever. Freedom, freedom, I can't move. Freedom, come and lose. Freedom, freedom, where are you? Cause I need freedom too. I break chains up on myself. Won't let my freedom ride in hell. Hey, I'ma keep on running cause the winner don't quit on themselves.
All right. I hope you all got a, a good chance to relax and stretch and get some water. Um, next, we have Commissioner Joan Hardesty from the Portland City Council. Um, Commissioner Hardesty oversees the Portland Fire and Rescue Bureau of Emergency Management, um, Bureau, Bureau of Emergency Communications, Fire and Police Disability and Retirement Fund. Commissioner Hardesty is committed to building a livable and sustainable city with and for all Portlanders with transparency, accountability, and opportunity. Speaking as a youth activist and as a woman of color, Commissioner Hardesty is an absolute inspiration for me, and I am absolutely so honored to be able to welcome her to our rally today. So I'm going to give it up for um, the commissioner. Thank you for being here today. It's all mine. Thank you so much for that fabulous introduction. And oh my gosh, I have been glued to my computer since the start of this rally. So first, happy Earth Day. Uh, it's been an absolutely wonderful virtual rally. I am also totally inspired by the Youth Pass panel and for their passion in making sure that youth transit justice is a part of this Earth Day celebration. Um, I also wanted to say that I, uh, someone mentioned Sisters in Action for Power, which uh, used to be a grassroots activist organization led by young girls from eight to 20 uh, who are working on transit equity as part of their uh, youth justice agenda. So how fabulous for the 30th anniversary to be reminded that youth activists have been the center of Earth Day justice for quite some time and for organizing in our community. Uh, so a couple of things that I wanted to also acknowledge, uh, the Green New Deal. Uh, we are in the midst of a pandemic that the world has never seen uh, before. We're going to come out of this pandemic with significant unemployment, um, and, but I also think great opportunity to create the kind of world we all want to live in. And so I wanna acknowledge that this moment is hard. This moment is extremely hard for communities of color and it's extremely hard for young people of color who are looking around wondering what are they gonna inherit uh, when Earth Day 2020 is over? What are we moving towards? And I wanna give you a bit of optimism I, I want you to know that what we have, what we had prior to the pandemic will never exist again. What we know is that we lived in a very inequitable society. We lived in very inequitable communities and frontline communities were suffering the brunt of the inequities. That's where we were. When we come out of this pandemic, the question before us today is what will we build? I have no interest in rebuilding our inequitable community. I have no interest in putting back in place uh, systems that don't work for frontline communities. So believe it or not, in the midst of stay home, uh, physical distancing, uh, not knowing what uh, next month will look like, much less next year, I am absolutely optimistic. I am optimistic that we can actually articulate what we want to rebuild, what our community will look like later as we come through this pandemic and get to the other side. I'm convinced that we have the ability to center frontline communities, uh, communities that are taking the brunt of the, uh, of the, uh, of the inequity today uh, based on testing, based on housing, based on employment security, uh, that these communities can thrive as we get into the future. Uh, so for me, uh, I am excited about both uh, what you're teaching today, which is that environmental justice has to be a center of uh, any Earth Day celebration. Uh, environmental justice must center uh, frontline communities, those most impacted. And I wanna remind you that today, uh, oil prices is at the lowest that they've ever been. In fact, they're selling at minus numbers and that we have the cleanest air that we've had in our community for the last 50 years. And so a new community is possible. 
a new community is necessary. Youth passes is, is a part of that. But let me say, don't let TriMet convince you that we can only get youth pass if we pass the, uh, the uh, transportation bill uh, or measure that will be on the November ballot. Youth pass is possible today with the right political will. Youth pass is possible today with the federal dollars that uh, TriMet got in uh, just over the last few days. They could implement a regional youth pass right now. Nothing's preventing them from doing that. So we don't have to wait for youth pass to pass something else. Today, TriMet needs youth riding public transit more than they've ever needed before. Um, and so we could have youth pass right now. Uh, and if we had the political will at TriMet, what I know is we have more tr transit dependent board members at TriMet, which makes it mu much more likely that as we come out of this pandemic, we will have a TriMet board that will represent transit dependent users. TriMet needs transit dependent users because as you saw in the pandemic, when people are fearful of riding public transit, people stay away in large numbers. TriMet needs us to want to come back in order for us to want to come back. TriMet has to be accessible. And quite frankly, if we just stop penalizing people without TriMet fares, uh, we could invest those resources that we're using in policing TriMet into providing uh, a fare for youth. And so I look forward to working with young people uh, to come out of this pandemic much better than we came in it. I look forward to working with you to hold TriMet accountable uh, for making TriMet accessible to young people year round, regardless of what school they go to. And I look forward to looking for to see what Green New Deal looks like. We don't have to actually expand a uh, 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 TriMet system in order to have a new Green Deal. So I look forward to our opportunities to work together coming out of this pandemic to have a much more uh, 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 centered focus uh, that centers frontline communities, that centers youth justice, that centers transit passes, and that centers making sure that we are centering those communities most impacted. Thank you, thank you, thank you for allowing me to speak and thank you for the work you do on this Earth Day and beyond. Wow, I am so inspired by Commissioner Hardesty. Um, people say that you can't be what you can't see and seeing Commissioner Hardesty inspires me to strive for more as a black woman, so thank you. Um, we know you are incredibly busy right now too. So next we have some more amazing and inspiring youth activists who have been helping to organize this virtual rally alongside us. The Sunrise Movement is building a moment, a movement of young people to make climate change an urgent, an urgent priority across America and the corrupting influence of fossil fuel executives in our politics and elect leaders who stand up for the health and well-being of all people. Give it up for Indy, Anna, and Anna. All right, hi there. Um, happy Earth Day, everyone. And thank you so much for tuning in to this amazing virtual rally. Um, this isn't exactly how we thought we would be spending our Earth Day just a few months ago, but we're so psyched that you're all here to join us. Um, I'm Anna Kaler. I'm a member and representative of the Sunrise Movement PDX. Sunrise is a movement of young people who are working to stop climate change and create millions of good jobs in the process. We are fighting for a Green New Deal at the local, state, and national levels to address uh, injustice and inequity and to create a just and sustainable future for all people. Our generation can oftentimes feel hopelessness and despair about climate change, um, or the climate crisis rather. Um, but by working together, we can create hope for future generations. I serve as one of the leads in the electoral engagement campaign, um, one of the many campaigns with opportunities for young organizers to be leaders in our community and push our elected officials to take strong climate action.
Wow, thanks so much, Anna. Um, hi, everybody. Happy Earth Day. I'm Indy Keith. I'm another member of Sunrise PDX. I'm one of our hub coordinators, and I also help to lead our Partnerships Alliance. Sunrise PDX has been doing a lot of reflecting on what the first Earth Day meant and what was accomplished because of that day. So 50 years ago, everyday people, people like us, saw that something was very wrong. The Cuyahoga River in Ohio caught fire. The California coast was devastated by an oil spill and communities across the country were being poisoned by smog and pollution. Students, labor organizers, civil rights leaders, and more came together to fight for a livable planet and held the first Earth Day in 1970. 20 million people, that's 10% of the US population, mobilized together and successfully pressured our government to create the Environmental Protection Agency, to put in regulations to keep our waterways safe and healthy, and to protect our planet and human communities from environmental harm in other ways too. When a coalition of ordinary people who were determined to fight for a livable future took action, they won. On this Earth Day, we're thinking about the ways that these original victories are being threatened today and about how uh, low income and black and brown communities uh, have often never been offered the full protection of those regulations. As we're facing down the climate crisis and environmental injustice, we're remembering that we are standing on the shoulders of these earlier movements and that together we can win too. We have massive people power when we come together, whether in person or virtually, but we also need to make our voices heard in the polls and on our ballots to tangibly impact our political system for the better. It is so beyond important for us as young people to vote and to encourage everyone we know to vote too. Awesome. Thanks, Anna and Indy. I'm Anna Kemper. I'm another member of Sunrise PDX, and I serve as our actions team coordinator, and I'm another lead on our electoral engagement campaign. And I'm really excited to be here talking uh, further about electoral engagement. We all have a role to play in getting local officials elected, whether we are a voting age or not. While COVID-19 is making so many things right now incredibly difficult and inconvenient, voting in Oregon is actually pretty easy, considering we are one of the few states that already vote, vote by mail. So for, for those of us who can vote, we have to make sure we are all registered by April 28th. That's just six days away on next Tuesday. Also, did you know that if you're 17 right now, but you'll be turning 18 on or before our primary day on May 19th, you can still vote. If you won't be 18 by the May 19th primary or cannot vote for any other reason, there's still so many ways to take action. Tell every voting age person in your life to vote in the primary this year. I'm serious, I want everyone to pause right now and text or DM five people right now and ask them if they're already registered. And remember, you can always reach out to your legislators about the issues that matter to you. Even if you can't vote yet, you're still their constituent and they represent you. Hold them accountable to representing your interests and your future. Thank you again to everyone for having us here, for tuning into this virtual Earth Day rally. Together, we're building a movement for an equitable and sustainable future. If you'd like to see some of Sunrise's political advocacy work, you can check us out on our website at sunrisepdx.org. Thanks. All right. So, um, thank you, Indy, Anna, and Anna, and all of Sunrise PDX. You guys are so awesome, and you've been so helpful with this entire virtual rally. Um, I know I'm 17, so I can't vote yet, and I won't be able to until 2021, but since I can't, you'll be sure that I will be telling all my family members and friends to get out and vote, and I hope you guys do too. So, but speaking of family, now I get to introduce someone very special to me, my twin sister, Lana Paris. So Lana is a youth activist and a poet who goes to Cleveland High School. She believes in the future of her generation and the world of justice. She's going to be performing a poem for the end of our virtual rally. Hey everyone. All right. Today I give thanks. I honor the people who fight for a better world and I honor those who fought when it mattered. This was not supposed to be my burden to bear. This earth is not dying. It is simply losing the ability to sustain life. But how could I explain the intrinsic value of a human life to you? How could I explain that through humanity is a celebration of laughter and love and pain, but we were not born to be America's prophet. We were not born to die. 
They say I cannot lose what I have never known, but all we have ever known is fear. And this is nothing in the face of the unknown. This generation rests on broken backs, you know. Caught between a war of white nationalism and humanity, we are defiant of a world in which the youth cannot breathe, the dreamers cannot dream, the wreckage of those red hats and what we might be. That was not supposed to be my burden to bear. You see, one day I would have liked to have kids. I would have wanted to see the Great Barrier Reef and I would have taken those kids there. And we would have lost ourselves to the tide and flow of an earth, both warm and wild. But I refuse to let this be their burden to bear. My future, now the product of America's greed encapsulated in the form of capitalism and whiteness. But what have I lost that was not taken from me by some white man? For what cheap American dream did I watch my mother break her back to afford? I love you, Amma. This country should not have been your burden to bear. For what are these last centuries but a reflection of pain? For what can I see when I look towards our future? America, who the fuck do you think you are? I am from the generation of the broken and the bone tired. We are the bone shattering, mountain moving, blood rot legacy you left behind. This was not our burden to bear. But in these broken and triumphant souls, we will once more shoulder the burden of a white man's greed. In this world, we will be the voices of the voiceless. But dear God, we will not be afraid. We will be the beating heart of this world as the reclamation of this land begins. We will not define ourselves through the long line of cultural genocide and institutionalized racism you forced upon us. Know that the silence of those you caused suffering comforts you no longer. Know that we are young and we are alive and we will prevail. And what you did unto us, we will return tenfold. Do not scold the children that you nursed on poisoned water and heroes of the unbreakable sort. Fear us, love us, see us, for all too soon you will need us. And we will not answer to the same hands that broke the backs of our mothers. We will not answer to your call of the slaughtering of innocence in your wars. America, we owe you nothing. Not our blood, not our money, not our love, and not our future. This was not our burden to bear, but you stood and watched as our house stood burning. And we will not stop to watch when we burn the burden of you with it. Thank you. Yalana, yeah, you killed that. What an amazing ending to this rally. Yes, um, that was amazing. And I'm so thankful and happy to be a part of this and be working with people like Lana who are just pioneers. So thank you. Oh, sis. Awesome. Um, we really um, quickly... Um, we're going to also share some responses that all you guys put for the Oregon Green New Deal. So the first question from the survey was, what's a positive change you've noticed during this crisis that you hope we can bring into the future? So Serena H. said, I am starting to see communities coming together and realizing a common goal. And Lisa, age 21, said, slowing down, holding space for envisioning a better future, being there for others. That's really good. Yeah, me too. And then the second question was, imagine it's 50 years in the future, your grandkids ask about the 2020 global pandemic. What do you hope that you will be able to tell them about how we transformed our society? So Damon, age 26 said, I wanna tell my grandkids that this pandemic brought us closer together to become a more caring society. I wanna tell them that we realized that so many things that were called impossible were not only possible, but totally doable without our shared, without our shared cooperation and will. I want to tell them that the pandemic was a wake-up call that prompted a surge of action that accelerated our transition to 100% community-owned renewable energy. That this was the moment that we buckled down and ended homelessness, made transit fareless, and passed Medicare for all. That we welcomed all immigrants and abolished detention, deportation, and incarceration. That we invested in people and not banks or corporations. Well said, Damon. Thank you. And then CGA Coles, age 28, said, I hope that we can tell, that I can tell them that COVID-19 was finally the wake-up call that humans needed. And then that was when we started to transform our world into an equitable and sustainable place to live. 
That was really well said, you guys. Thank you so much. These responses are amazing. It just makes me think about what we could all do to write that Oregon Green New Deal and envision it and make it make our plans and our dreams and our hopes really come alive. I love those so much. Um, and I actually have another way to keep building community together right now. And that is to celebrate Earth Day responsibly with your neighbors. So at 6 p.m., um, that's very soon, join together outside or from a window at a safe distance to participate in chants and make as much noise as you can. That could be banging pots and pans, honking your horn, etc. If your neighbor couldn't tune into the rally, you can still invite them to come make some noise. And then tonight and tomorrow, we're also, you guys should join us for a digital chase takeover. So did you guys know that JP Morgan Chase is the largest funder of fossil fuel industries in the world? It is so completely wrong and it is time to demand their funding of destruction to end. So that's why we're gonna all leave educational reviews on sites like Google Maps, Yelp, and Facebook to emphasize Chase's dominant role in funding the destruction of our futures. So check it out by visiting the link in the comments or by typing it in. And we're gonna leave that right soon, yeah. Um, this was such a team effort. We couldn't have done any of this without so many people. Um, 350 PDX, the Sunrise Movement, Opal in Asia, Asian Pacific American, American Network of Oregon, Anafian PDX, Oregon Physicians for Social Responsibility, and more. They've been awesome in helping support all of us youth organizers to make our ideas come alive. So thank you. Thank you also to the Minor Memorial Trust and the Bullet Foundation for making this entire event possible and for supporting youth organizing and movement building. Um, we also want to take a moment to thank our amazing tech team, Chris and Chuck. Yes, shout out to Chris and Chuck. This wouldn't have been possible without them. Also, we wanted to thank the organizers who have been so instrumental and so supportive of all of us youth organizers and making our dreams come alive. We want to thank Ale, Dallas, and Deneen especially. Love you guys and thank you so much. And then we also want to take a time to thank our teammates, Vivian Sue and Jackson Calhoun for helping us create this entire um, virtual rally. We love you guys so much and we need you. Thank you. And mostly we wanna thank all of you, the viewers. Um, thank you for joining us for this virtual rally. And we hope and encourage that you take what you've learned here today and apply it to your own activism in your local communities. We could not have done any of this without your support. Just by being here, you are contributing to a just and equitable future. We are in awe of how even after a global pandemic, y'all continue to stay active and involved. That's all we can do, right? <laughs> um, again, thank you so much and have a happy Earth Day. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Say the black of the belly, the sweet of the juice. I say the dark of the flesh, and the deep of the roots. I give my honor to my sister's own welfare. Keep my kids, if don't nobody else care.
Thank you. 